Thank you, ladies, so very, very much. The Lighthouse. You know, we've always uh, talked about us here at Rosemont as being a lighthouse to this community. Do you realize, especially as we're going to be talking about righteousness today, we're individually lighthouses to those that come around us. And you know, for some people you run into, you may be the only Jesus they'll ever see. Thank you for that, uh, thank you for that song. Uh, this sermon series that we've been doing on spiritual warfare, we have looked at uh, the various aspects of this battle, this spiritual battle that we fight every day. Last week, uh, we, uh, we started looking at the armor of God, and as we go through Ephesians uh, 6, we're looking at each piece individually. Last week, we looked at the belt of truth, and today we're going to examine the breastplate of righteousness. That's our sermon title today, The Armor of God, Part 2, Righteousness. Righteousness. You see, between truth and righteousness, integrity and right living are two basic equipments in the arsenal of the Christian. These two qualities are important because through them we become more like the likeness of God. And we're going to read about that uh, in another passage in Ephesians in a few minutes. Our focus today is going to be on the second part of uh, the second half of verse 14 in Ephesians 6, which is on the breastplate of righteousness. But I want to read what we read last week to put it all into context. All in the context. So if you would, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. This morning I'm going to be reading from verses 14 through 18. Ephesians 6. And I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. Beginning in verse 14. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Verse 18, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we do fight a battle every day, Lord, may we be fully equipped for the battle, for the things that the devil throws our way, for the temptations of the world, for the things that we come in contact with each and every day. Lord, may we be found faithful, faithful with the armor that you have provided us. Lord, this morning as we dive into your word, open up our hearts, open up our minds, and open our understanding that we may understand what you have for us today. May Jesus be glorified. May we feel his presence, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. When we talk about righteousness, oftentimes, and I'm guilty, you know, we can be very self-righteous. Of course I'm right. Case in point was uh, a number of years ago in the Missouri legislature, a legislator accepted a $25,000 bribe for his vote in regard to a certain bill. A little later, before the bill came up for a vote, someone else came up to him and gave him $50,000 to vote the other way. So he returned the $25,000. And when the man, this legislator, who had turned state's evidence, I guess to avoid prosecution for bribery, um, 
he was relating the story on the witness stand. In the examining attorney, he asked him the question. He said, why did you return the 25000 And the legislator drew himself up to his full height and in a voice that showed much scorn for the lawyer for even daring to ask such a question. He answered, he says, I'll have you know I am too conscientious to take money from both sides. He must have said to himself, I'm righteous in my own eyes, you know. If I'm, if I'm going to take a bribe, I'm not going to take it from both sides, you know. I, I, I don't know. You see, it's this sort of thing that is getting our country in trouble today. History repeats itself. You know, you can go back some 3,000 years, actually about 3,300 years ago when this was written, to ancient Israel. They had just come back uh, from Egypt, and they were settling in, uh, in the land. And, and, and as we read through the book of Judges, uh, Judges is a horrible book to read. It talks about how the people deviate from the Lord. But I want to quote, and I've quoted this before, the very last line, the very last line in the book of Judges. Judges 21 verse 25. And it said, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in, their, in his own eyes. You know, if we do what's right in our own eyes, there is no standards, you know. There, there's all kinds of people saying, well, what's wrong with this, that, and the other? We know about how Israel, the chosen people of God, had departed from the Lord after God had brought them up to the land of Egypt, and God had performed many miracles within their own eyes. The writer of Proverbs summed this up quite nicely. Proverbs 14, verse 12. There's a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. You know, it's not about what we think is right or wrong. You know, when, when God gave us his word, he didn't ask Doug Fannin for his opinion. <laughs> you see, God determines what's right and wrong, and he has given it in his word, and it tells us how we should live. What is the meaning of righteousness? Little definition here. The word means to make right. The, word, the root word in the Greek talks about straightness, to be straight. Righteousness and justice and justification are from the same root word in the Greek. God is righteous in all that he does. God established the standards of righteousness because he is judge. Psalms 50 verse 6. And the heavens declare his righteousness. For God himself is judge. God determines what's right and wrong. God determines what's, what is required for right living. And as we will see, righteousness or right living before God is only done in our obedience to God according to his purposes and it results in purity and blamelessness. Remember when we talked about the devil a few weeks ago? One of the adversaries that we must face in this Christian life and in the battle, spiritual battle, that we fight all, all the time. We, we know from reading in Revelation 12, Satan is accusing us before God. And you see, with right living before God, we take away Satan's ammunition. Paul proclaimed over in Romans 1, verses 16 and 17, Paul said, he said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Wednesday night a few weeks ago, uh, we were studying the book of Habakkuk. This is a quote from the book of Habakkuk. If you notice in the New American Standard, every time you see all caps, 
Uh, it's quoting from the Old Testament. The righteous man shall live by faith. Our focus today as we examine the armor of God is the breastplate of righteousness. We're going to come back to faith here in a second. And, and, and we got to understand the breastplate. When the Roman soldier puts on his armor, he starts with his belt. We talked about this last week, and it gives him freedom of movement. And everything else hinges on the belt. And, and next he puts on the breastplate. And often these breastplates not only covers the front, it covers the back as well. And it was often made out of very stiff leather with metal plates attached. They were used to protect major organs including the heart you see right living righteousness will pro protect our vital organs including our heart Ephesians 6 verse 14 the second part of that verse says and having put on the breastplate of righteousness now remember, we're talking about the armor of God. Remember Paul, he is writing this to the Christians in the church of Ephesus. These are not unsaved people. He's not converting anyone here. He's given them instructions, these Christians, on how they should live. And, and those, these are those who know the Lord. And I want you to notice, it says, having put, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Uh, in the Greek, it's, this is in the aortis tense, and that means it's a snapshot of something that has already happened in the past. It is, it is a look of what has already been done. And if you look in your Bibles, I hope your Bibles are open, and you skip back, you just go back to the first part of that uh, verse. It says, having girded your loins, aortis tense, something you've already done. And if you look at verse 15, it says, having shod your feet having shot your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, having shot, that's in the aortis tense, is something that we have, should have already done. Well, have we done them? You see, as a Christian, we should have already had righteousness. You see, the implication there is twofold. One, we have the righteousness of God as a result of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. And second, by virtue of that righteousness imparted to us by the work of Jesus, that we are able, by the Spirit of God, to live righteously. The two together are very important. Warren Worsby, one of my favorite commentators, in his commentary, he says, our positional rightness in Christ, that is our rightness, righteousness that Christ imparts to us, that our positional righteousness in Christ without practical righteousness in our daily lives only gives Satan opportunity to attack us. We're going to look at both types of these righteousness. We certainly cannot stand in our own righteousness. When we look at, this is what I've done, when we talk about being self-righteous, this is what Isaiah has to tell us in the Old Testament. Isaiah 64, verse 6. He says, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. All of us, and all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. Our righteousness before God is like a filthy rag uh, in the King James. It is only by what Jesus has done for us on the cross that we can stand at all. And at the time of our conversion, we take on some portion of those attributes of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30, Paul writes, he says, but by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. We talked about what that means to be in Christ Jesus earlier this year. He says, by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption redemption. We obtain that righteousness not by our own works of righteousness, but by faith in Jesus. 
This is what we talked about uh, earlier when we said that the righteous man shall live by faith. It is by faith accepting what Jesus has done for us. Philippians 3 verse 9. Paul writes to the Philippians, he says, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law. That means he followed the law faithfully. It's not because of that righteousness. He says, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, accepting what Jesus has done. Jesus has placed us in the position of righteousness before God. This is our positional righteousness. When we stand before God, it is the righteousness of Jesus that God sees. But what about that daily battle that we fight? What about that battle that we fight each and every day? The devil looks for every opportunity. The life we live either fortifies us against the attacks of Satan, or it makes it easier for the devil to undermine us and to destroy our witness. William Barclay, he's another favorite commentator uh, from England, uh, in his commentary, he says, when a man is clothed in righteousness, he is impregnable. Words are no defense against the accusation, but a good life is. Once a man accused Plato, Plato who lived back in the uh, first millennium BC, he, he accused Plato of a certain crime. Well then, said Plato, we must live in such a way as to prove that his accusations are a lie. The only way to meet accusations against Christianity is to show how good a Christian can be. Paul tells us that as a Christian, as a Christian that day when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we become a new creation. I preached on this a couple of months ago. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, the new things have come. And as a new creation, as a new creature, we are to put on the new man. We are not like the rest of the world. Ephesians 4 verse 17 to 19 Paul writes he says so this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk Gentiles are all non-believers is what he's referring to here as the Gentiles also walk in the fruitility of their mind being darkened in their understanding excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the hardness of their heart and they having become callous have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greedness you see we are to walk as God created us in righteousness and holiness. This is the verse I was referring to earlier, Ephesians 4, 23 to 24. And he says that you'll be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self or put on the new man, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. As I mentioned earlier, righteousness and truth here, the holiness of the truth, they go together. And this is, this is how we are to imitate God. Not only is God righteous, revealing his righteousness in his mighty acts, he also expects righteousness of his own. Those who are able to reflect the nature of their creator. How do we reflect the nature of one who created us? You see, we're created in the image of God. Ephesians 5 verse 1, just a few verses down. It says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Children imitate their parents. Do we imitate our Father who is in heaven? As imitators of God, my righteousness is not based upon who I am, but it's all based upon who He is. It is not my standard for righteousness. I don't set the bar. I don't set the standard. Jesus sets the standards for righteousness. The most miserable creature in the world 
I don't believe is necessarily the sinful and un, unrighteous, the unregenerated non-believer. You see, they don't know any better. I believe the most miserable person is the believer, the one who calls themselves a Christian, who has the Holy Spirit dwelling within them, who have tasted the goodness and grace of God, but refuses to live the righteous life that God has called them to live. The Holy Spirit won't leave them alone. I believe they're truly miserable if they're not living the life that God has called them to live. People are quick to point out that God gives grace and he is quick to forgive. So why should we worry about how we live our lives? Because, you know, God will forgive me. And besides, don't we believe, you know, this is a, a Baptist saying, you know, once saved, always saved. Well, I believe that's true. But Paul had a word to say about this kind of attitude. In Romans 6, verses 1 and 2, he says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? May it never be. I like the King James here. God forbid, it says. God forbid. How shall we who die to sin still live in it? We're not called to live in sin. And oftentimes, and I've mentioned this here uh, before, I have people come up to me and they say, you know, Brother Doug, you know, God loves me just the way I am. And that's true. He does love you the way, he, the way you are. But the problem is, is God loves you way too much to leave you that way. He's called us to something bigger and better. Think about it. Consider the Old Testament story. And you know the story about David and Bathsheba. You know that story. You can find it in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12 and go home and read that. And uh, you know, when you, when you read it, understand that soap operas on TV has nothing on stories in the Bible. This is one of them. You see, David, David, a man after God's own heart, had an adulterous affair with the wife of one of his top men. You know, one of his buds, and he was in with his wife. And to make a long story short, and I encourage you to go back and read it, Bathsheba got pregnant. And to cover it up, David had Uriah, her husband, killed. You see, David was only doing his thing. He was only doing what came naturally. He went out on the porch one day and looked down and saw Bathsheba bath, bathing and said, Boy, I like that. And he just going on and doing what comes naturally. You see, David, a man after God's own heart, committed a great sin, the adulterous affair and murder to cover it up. David dropped a piece of his armor. He left off the breastplate of righteousness. Listen to what Nathan the prophet had to say to David when it all came to light. You know, the Bible is very clear. Your sin will find you out. 2 Samuel 12 verse 14 says, However, because by this deed you have given occasion to the enemy of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born to you shall surely die. You see, without righteous living, we give the enemies of God an opening. An enemies of God an opening. Mike read from this earlier, and I want to repeat just a couple of verses. Romans 6, verses 12 to 13. He says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies so that you obey its lust. And do not go on presenting the members of your bodies as instruments to sin, as instruments of unrighteousness. But present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. We are to be the instrument of righteousness to the world. R.C. Sproul, he died a couple of years ago, uh, he commented concerning the breastplate of righteousness. He said, when believers are living in unconfessed sin, they are vulnerable to the assaults of Satan. 
You know, it's a funny thing about sin. You, you sin a little bit now, and it's easier to sin a little bit more later. You know, we got to rid ourselves of this. We are called to righteous living. As Christians, we become God's instrument of righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. He who made him, that is God who made Jesus, uh, made, he made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. Jesus became became our sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ as we are in Christ being in Christ we become the righteousness of God before the world we represent God remember what I said you know we're about the lighthouse we may be the only Jesus people see what kind of Jesus are you to the people that you see? We are the instruments of righteousness of God. Jesus became our righteousness before God. How can we live anything less for him? We represent him to the world. Philippians 2 verses 12 through 13. Uh, Paul writes, he says, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now, how much, uh, now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Working out our salvation with fear and trembling. This doesn't mean we're working to earn our salvation. It's because of the salvation that we have. We work it. We put it to use. We become that instrument of righteousness. And it's about using that salvation that Jesus died to obtain, to obtain for us. I tremble when I think that Christ died for me. He died for me. It would have been far easier for him to require my death. You know, the wages of sin is death. How much easier it would have been was saying, hit that smite button. Doug, you're gone because of my sins. But he took them away. How can I do no less in doing those things that he has commanded me to do? In the Old Testament... Righteousness was defined by obedience to the law. I mean, go back to the very beginning. Adam and Eve would have acted righteously in their relationship with God if they had only obeyed him. Because his command defined it, that relationship. The Ten Commandments and the related laws that defined it, Israel's relationship with God. To obey those laws was to act righteously. The sacrificial system in the Old Testament and the cross of Jesus in the New Testament shows man's need for righteousness because it is our nature to live unrighteously. We need something to cover our sins. Since the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, man has been inherently unrighteous. 1 John 2.4 the one who says, I have come to know him. I, I know Jesus. Those who say, I know Jesus. And does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. I'm not calling him a liar. The word of God is. We need to live for him. We need to obey him. Man cannot be righteous in the sight of God on our own merits. Therefore, man must have God's righteousness imputed or transferred to him. Have you taken on the righteousness that Jesus offers? You see, the cross of Jesus is a public demonstration of God's righteousness. God accounts or transfer the righteousness of Christ to those who trust in him. In Romans 4, 3 Paul, speaking of Abraham, he says, For what does the scripture say? And quoting from Genesis, he says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. You see, it wasn't just simply that Adam believed, I mean, excuse me, uh, that Abraham believed, but he acted on that belief. His actions defined that belief. 
Do you have a righteousness that can only come from him? If you have his righteousness, and his righteousness, it is the righteousness of Jesus that is, that is seen before God, are you living a life that is worthy of that righteousness? You see, we don't do anything right unless he is in it. Unless we are uh, abiding in him and as we are striving to live through the spirit. You cannot do it on your own. It's only through the spirit that this is possible. Living right before God, living right before God protects our hearts. It protects us from accusation of the devil. It enables us to live boldly for Christ before the world. The question this morning is, have you put on, or have you even taken off, you know? We have already put on, but are we wearing the breastplate of righteousness? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning knowing that righteousness only comes from you. I can only live righteous through your power. Lord, power us, enable us to live right for you, that we might live boldly for you in a world that sorely needs to hear your word. And Lord, may we be the Jesus that people need to see. Lord, move among us, touch us today. There may be someone uh, here today, there may be someone listening to this broadcast or to this recording later that needs to know the righteousness of Jesus because they don't stand without it. Lord, may they come to a saving knowledge of Jesus and be caught up in his power today. Lord, we are here today before you, lifting up your name. Lord, move among us and touch us. May Jesus be glorified, for it's in his holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.